One of our most precious resources, fresh and clean drinking water, is in short supply. The largest desalination plant in North America, located near Tampa, Florida, uses reverse osmosis to create safe, clean, and much-needed water for a thirsty public. Here's a look. A burgeoning population, expanded farming, and increased manufacturing all demand more water. Tampa Bay Water provides safe water for the communities in the Bay Area. General Manager Matt Jordan knows the challenges of finding more water. There was a lot of uh, discussion and research done in making certain that we had a plan moving forward that would make us drought resistant and to deal with those prolonged dry periods that we do sometimes experience. Most communities have two sources, but here in Tampa Bay, a third option has emerged. Traditionally in Florida, we, we've had groundwater, and we have surface water from rivers, and we also have desalinated seawater from Tampa Bay. Their desalination plant is located in the Big Bend area in Gibsonton, Florida. Chief Operating Officer Chuck Carden explains how they take undrinkable seawater and create safe, delicious drinking water. We are here at the front end of the Tampa Bay seawater desalination facility. As you can see behind me, the water's flowing in, and that water is coming from our partner and our friend across the street at the Big Bend Power Plant. They take in 1.4 billion gallons every day from the bay to use in their process of making electricity. They use that water to cool their condenser units, and then after they're done, it goes right back into the bay. And we asked them if we could have 44 million gallons of that 1.4 billion gallons. The plant operates in multiple stages. First, the water goes through pretreatment. We're adding some chemicals. In order for it to get the smaller particles to stick together, the foam on top is uh, the proteins in the water. If you're ever at the beach and you see the waves come up, you may see similar uh, foaming action. You can also see the, the rust color in the water. That's the chemical we add, the coagulant, ferric chloride. And then there's some large fan blades being turned by that motor that's stirring everything up, mixing it really well. We're trying to get the smaller particles to glue together, stick together, get heavier, and settle to the bottom. There's some large chains that pull boards every 10 feet apart, and it's basically taking what's fallen out of suspension and is now on the bottom, and drags it to the very end of the pool where there's some pumps that we pump out that waste. The salt water now goes through sand filters to remove larger particles. The sand is being rotated by air, and they come into contact. The dirty particles attach themselves to the sand. Now, one of the neat things about this is we don't have to shut any of the uh, filters down to backwash them. They continuously clean themselves as they're working. You'll see the sand being thrown up against the sides. The dirty water comes off of the sand particles, gets collected, and the clean sand goes right back in drops underneath the pipe and does some more cleaning. A second massive filter system removes very small particles that have made it this far. The diatomaceous earth filter is basically been around a long time. Those vessels are about 20 feet tall. There's 18 of them inside there. And if we took the lid off, there would be these long tubes, and we call them candles that hang down from the lid. There's about 300 of these candles on each one of those uh, vessels. We get diatomaceous earth powder. It looks a lot like talcum powder. Add water to it, make a slurry, and then we introduce it into the vessel and it actually coats the outside of each one of those candles. And then we pull the water through to the center and moves on. All of the dirt that's trapped on the outside collects until at some point, we've got to shut down and backwash each one of those vessels. Only one unwanted compound remains, sodium chloride, commonly known as salt. The clean seawater is now introduced to reverse osmosis, where membranes pass smaller molecules. The water comes into this building and is pressurized up to 1,000 PSI and pushed through each one of those membranes. There are over 10,000 of these membranes inside of this plant, and they cost generally around $500 a piece, so you can get the idea how expensive they are. Under high pressure, small molecules like H2O or water pass through the membrane, and large molecules like sodium chloride or salt are held back. 
In fact, what comes through there is one one hundred thousandth of the size of a human hair can only get through. Eventually, the clean water gets to the center of those tubes, is collected together, and it is sent over to another part of the plant called our post-treatment. The salt continues on its way, being trapped from getting in, but eventually exits out the, the backside, and it's still at 900 PSI. So we collect that and that energy, and we use it to spin a turbine to help us with our power costs. The brine water is then mixed with the 1.4 billion gallons of power plant water and returned to the bay. This dilution keeps the salinity increase to a minimum. Surprisingly, pure water is not considered suitable for human consumption. The post-treatment process puts back essential minerals. We want to raise the alkalinity and the pH to get water to taste like water is supposed to taste and also give the water back its minerals so it doesn't go looking for it in our pipes and eventually we'll have all of our pipes corroded. We collect it in a five million gallon tank and then we pump it all the way 14 miles up to our Brannon treatment facility where it is blended with our surface waters and then finally shipped out to the, uh, the customer. Currently, this is the largest desalination plant in North America and it's had a positive impact on our communities and the environment. This plant can provide up to 10% of the Tambay region's drinking water needs, or 25 million gallons a day. We're operating these uh, and using these natural resources in a very sustainable way, and also to get through those dry seasons because it is unpredictable. And having that third option of desalination gives us the ability to get through those times much more effectively. <laughs>